Uh, the next speaker needs no introduction, the host here. Uh, Josh Bloom, Associate Professor in the Astronomy Department here at Cal and co-PI of the Center for Time Domain and Informatics. Uh, his talk, which I've lost, which is Joey's talk, which is Josh's talk. This is classification of astronomical time series in the synoptic survey era. Josh, all here. Well, thanks. Um, the reason for showing you this amalgam of um, Galileo's uh, notebook, uh, about 400 years old or so, is uh, multifold. One is that time domain astronomy has been around for a while. In fact, uh, millennia before that, there were a number of astronomers doing quantitative science. Um, another is that uh, astronomers have realized for a long time that it's crucial that when we look up in the sky, with new tools, um, we find interesting things. And in some, sometimes those things are transformative. Uh, in some sense, this page uh, is one of the nails in the coffin against the Ptolemaic picture of our place in the universe. Um, planets were not supposed to be fixed, or were they? they were supposed to be fixed spherical orbs, not with their own moons. Um, and so this picture, these actual observations, didn't fit that world order. Another thing to point out is that astronomers are incredibly opportunistic. Uh, Galileo heard about this discovery of a telescope in the Netherlands. He said, oh, I'm going to take that and I'm going to do something with that. So maybe we're doing the same thing um, in machine learning now in astronomy. Um, and the last thing is uh, to emphasize sort of the crucial role that humans have always played in the data collection, the data analysis, and then the inference and coming up with the idea of what actually you're seeing here, that, that these are four moons uh, moving around a, a planet. Um, is not something that would be easy to teach a, a computer even today. I'd like to say that I'm happy to be here to give this talk, but I'm not happy to be here to give this talk uh, because Joey should have been giving this, but unfortunately got called away on uh, urgent family business. Um, I am happy, however, to uh, be part of and direct the Center for Time Domain Informatics here at Berkeley. It's been a really fruitful collaboration sponsored uh, mostly by the National Science Foundation uh, which is also um, offsetting some of the costs of, uh, of this workshop. Um, and in particular, other than working with great students and great postdocs, it's also been very exciting uh, to work with our colleagues in the statistics and um, computer science departments. And uh, we feel like this has been uh, very fruitful for all involved. It's not just uh, you know, computer scientists helping astronomers. It's also astronomers presenting to computer scientists um, some data sets that they perhaps weren't uh, expecting to get. I'll take a bit of a step back um, and tell you about the dynamic, the changing universe. Uh, you've already seen lots of snippets of this throughout the whole afternoon, so I'll go um, fairly quickly here. The first thing to note is that every single star changes. Every star, uh, at some level, if you can uh, get enough precision, you will notice a change in brightness, a change in color, um, and pretty soon we're going to be able to notice essentially the entire galaxy uh, moving with um, new satellites. So this is... Um, uh, when we think about the skies as sort of fixed heavens, that's absolutely wrong. It's, it, it is a, a cinematic movie, and we need to understand how it's changing. Um, there's some dramatic things that happen, as you heard from uh, Ashish, that stars die and they, they blow up in the form of supernovae, gamma ray bursts, and perhaps new phenomena. And the important thing is that when we find these things that are changing um, and, and recognize that this is actually perhaps interesting, that doesn't mean that we actually understand why it's changing. The greatest insights require follow-up, that is, using other telescopes, uh, perhaps getting imaging or spectroscopy, or looking at um, databases uh, to really understand what it is that we're seeing. And I think the thing that all of you intuit uh, from your own world is that follow-up is very expensive. So the cost for being wrong about what you do at the moment of discovery, um, not following through on something that you should have followed through on, following through on something that turned out to be pretty boring, um, that is something that we need to quantify, and sort of this, that sort of aspect pervades um, a lot of our work. Uh, and when we talk about expense, you know, we're talking about people, telescope time, uh, et cetera, uh, and, but it really comes down to money. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of what we're doing um, in the context of uh, sort of a resource-aware follow-up um, when it comes to discovery and classification. One is um, for these objects called gamma ray bursts. These are basically short-lived blasts of high energy light at X-ray um, and gamma ray wave bands. Here's a picture of the entire sky, the static sky, and then one of these events happens and it essentially hits you over the head. So here, discovery is essentially trivial. 
Um, uh, the problem is we don't know when they're going to happen because they're very rare. They happen sort of order one, once per day over the whole sky. But when they happen, you know they've happened. Um, the thing is that many of these objects, as this, as this field has matured, have become not that interesting. There's a few types of objects, the ones that are essentially really nearby and the ones that are really far away, are the ones that we really want to spend our resources on. Um, except uh, astronomers don't know intrinsically the distance that, it, uh, that a, a light source is to us. And so getting that th third dimension, it's easy to pick out where it is on the sky, but getting to the third dimension is incredibly hard. And we only have a limited amount of data and a limited amount of time to, to follow up. The cool thing is that after a gamma ray burst goes off, in terms of time since explosion, if you look at the total brightness, um, gamma ray bursts for uh, tens of seconds up to minutes, perhaps even an hour or so, are the brightest objects uh, in the known universe. And so we can use them if we find them very far away to basically exploit everything between and understand everything between us and that object. So there's a huge premium on very rapidly, uh, that is order of tens of seconds, um, recognizing that you have something that's really worth spending time on um, and not spending time on things that aren't all that interesting. Um, I won't go into the details of what makes them, but the important uh, challenge for us is how can we maximize our, our scientific return by optimizing follow-up. So I just said discoveries very easy. The question is now how do we recognize that these objects may also be very interesting to follow up on. So something that uh, my student has been working on within uh, this group out of Morgan um, is uh, basically taking uh, some of the immediately available data, and there's essentially histograms against all the, uh, of these parameters against all the other parameters, and um, looking at sort of the boring stuff in black, uh, and then uh, we want to actually get at the red stuff here. And you see this is a very hard problem. It looks like the red and the black are almost uh, on top of each other. And so the idea is, obviously, in, in, you know, some sort of um, linear de decomposition of the space would more or less fail, so we need to do this... Uh, uh, with a random forest or something that's um, inherently nonlinear. And we want to be able to predict which of the gray events are likely to be of the sort of type red events. Um, and this is a very hard problem because you obviously see a huge imbalance, right? The easiest thing is just to say none of them are interesting, but then that's really bad because we lose those. Um, and so you have to really uh, play around with um, this, this imbalance problem and try to come up with some robust statements. And um, so the, the result of, of that work showed that if we only follow up about 50% of the most likely events to be at the so-called high ridge, if those are the ones that are farthest away, we're going to get something like 80% or so of those that are high ridge. Now, you're losing 20%, but you're not using all of your resources. And so it allows you to dial up and down depending upon what telescope resources you have now. We're talking about uh, you know, Hubble Space Telescope the largest uh, telescopes in the world um, on the ground. So we're talking about billion dollar resources that we want to use efficient, efficiently. And doing this inefficiently is, uh, is a shame. So those are the sort of types of objects that we know about. There's also a bunch of different types of explosive events in the universe that many of us are interested in. There's the ones that we do know about. There's the ones that uh, have been hypothesized to be there. I won't go into all the details of all these things. Some of these things may be happening uh, on very short time scales, and we need to react with our follow-up resources very quickly. This is sort of subsampling the Rumsfeldian space of the known knowns and the known unknowns. But of course, there's the unknown unknowns, which I can't plot here because if I if I did, then it, it would break the the, uh, the definition. Um, and so we have all this sort of universe that's teeming that we want to get at some of these objects that we know about. We want to get some of the objects that we've been thinking about. And we want to also be able to find objects that we never even conceived of before. And that's why we're so excited in the astronomical community with this decade and what, what's upcoming um, in looking at these, the Large Synaptic Survey Telescope, which you've heard about today, probably pushing to more like 2020 at this point. But for that, we're looking at something like 800 million light curves every day updated sort of on, on three-day time scale. We're looking at a million supernovae a year um, and then uh, a, not a large amount of data uh, but if we're now trying to sift through this in a needle haystack problem, uh, that's going to be, um, uh, I think, where the, where the main challenges are going to lie. Uh, we've heard about from uh, Alex uh, earlier today about low far and SKA working at radio wave bands, uh, some millimeter wave bands, and then also Gaia, which you heard mentioned uh, in Ashish's talk of this astrometric mission that's going to be looking at something of order of a billion stars. But the important thing here is that 
we're already, uh, many of us, uh, the astronomers in the room, are already starting to cut our teeth on existing data sets, kind of learning how we can make good sense of this um, without uh, people in the, in the loop. And it, it, it should be very clear here that it's going to be hard to get um, a number of citizen scientists at the, at the level of a billion um, or uh, that many grad students uh, looking at this data all the time. So what's, what, what we really want to know is how we do discovery, how we do follow-up, how we actually do inference when the data rates um, and the requisite time scales for doing the follow-up uh, preclude uh, any human involvement. So we're really talking about taking the astronomer out of that loop and trying to understand how we can put machines in that loop to um, make as good of a, 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 a science impact as possible. So it's no surprise, of course, um, that uh, machine learning is becoming an important surrogate for the traditional astronomer. And here we're trying to make quick, concrete, deterministic, repeatable statements about abstract concepts. One, uh, in the context of discovery is, is this object that I see in my image actually real? Or is it spurious? Um, and you might think, well, shouldn't you just do statistics on it? Except uh, you can get lots of different types of spurious detections. And it turns out real objects sort of cluster in a very small um, abstract space. This is the question of discovery in the Palomar Transient Factory, which is um, something that Peter and I and a number of others have been working on. We get something like 1.5 million candidates of potentially new real objects a night only about one in a thousand of them are actually astrophysically real. Forget about whether they're interesting or not. Um, and we've already opined on something like uh, 800 million um, candidates, and we do that with um, a, an automatic classifier that's been trained on a very, very small subset of that data. Just to give you um, a view of what this classifier is trying to deal with is um, we have a new image that was just taken, say, last night. We have a reference image, which is uh, a slightly deeper stack um, from that same part of the sky from previous nights. And we do a subtraction to look for objects, which would be very hard to do just by putting a photometric aperture over, uh, say, this galaxy and looking for this new object that is indeed a real new object. But how do you identify this in the face of all these other things? Your eye is very good at picking that up. But how do you train a machine uh, to do this? This is something that uh, Stephen Bailey um, uh, pioneered a number of years ago, and we've been um, sort of pushing on. And then in some cases, it's very easy. Here's some galaxy, and then here's uh, this new object on top of this galaxy, and then this thing just sort of pops out uh, um, at you. What's exciting is that this uh, machine learning classifier on this question of discovery has been working uh, more or less in real time uh, for a few years now, and um, it's been enabling a number of important discoveries. Um, probably the one that many of you are familiar with is uh, the discovery of a nearby supernova in the Pinwheel Galaxy um, that essentially the, the codes more or less pushed to the top of the stack um, this, uh, this one object and promoted this uh, basically for human eyes to be able to look at and, and, and make the discovery. And this happened so quickly, in, again, in the face of order a million candidates a night, this one was the, was the needle in that haystack. It allowed us to really do a, a a great deal of science um, with it. So it wasn't just the discovery, because that would have happened uh, probably days later by amateur astronomers who love this galaxy and, and look at it every night. Um, but it allowed us to get on it very quickly and do the kind of follow-up resources with the billion dollar facilities that would have been impossible um, if you just had people in that real-time loop. Um, the other thing which gets more interesting, and we do make that sharp distinction between discovery and classification in the sense that um, you know, Galileo, many of you may not know this, um, actually had in his notebook um, a, a marking of Neptune, um, but he didn't recognize that it was interesting. So he had essentially found, Gal he found uh, Neptune, but he didn't discover it. Um, and he didn't recognize that this was an important um, planet. I, I always argue that if he had found Neptune, it took another 250 years or so before somebody actually discovered it, uh, Galileo would have been pretty famous. Um, but this is this question now of classification. So you have an interesting astrophysical object. Uh, what are you going to wind up doing with it? This should be really easy. Here's the taxonomy of all the variable and, trans and transient uh, objects. You have a whole bunch of sort of prototypes of all of those things. It should be you get your data, you do your dynamic time warping, and then you've got your perfect answer. Um, but the problem is astronomers don't get data that looks like this. Even though this is a little bit sparse, this is actually great data. Um, 
Our data is noisy and irregularly time sampled. So you can see that right here. We have bad data. This is not uh, you know, the universe trying to be mean, but this is something failing in the upstream um, code bases that are giving us data points that are clearly wrong. And so how do you recognize anomaly in the face of um, bad and noisy data is a very interesting question. And then in terms of follow-up, the, the events that you may be interested in haven't actually happened yet, so you have to have some sort of predictive modeling on this noisy data. So what many of us do, and I'm sure many of you do in your own domains, is uh, we um, more or less abstract those light curves and put them into uh, a, a large dimensional feature space, and we're sort of approaching 100 features now. Some of these are I.O. limited, so we have to make database calls to other databases which may or may not be down, which may or may not throttle us. Um, there are some that we can calculate immediately on the fly. Another one, like Loam Scargle, as in Jeff Scargle periodogram, um, is incredibly powerful as a discriminant for, class for classification, but is incredibly expensive um, to compute these uh, features. Anyway, we throw this into uh, you know, random forest frameworks, and then we do pretty well in our um, confusion matrix of uh, this is the true class, and up here is the uh, predicted class. Um, and this is all sort of tenfold cross-validated. Ideally, what you'd like to have is sort of a perfect diagonal across here. But what you can wind up seeing is that there's a lot of off-diagonal power. And in the context of what you heard um, earlier uh, today from Alex's talk about um, how they were essentially able to rediscover these lick parameters in their, uh, uh, in their formalism, what's kind of interesting and exciting is that while we haven't imbued any real physics um, into this classifier, what started popping out is that a lot of the, um, uh, the misclassification was happening within broad classes of types of variables that we actually know. Um, and so this is very interesting. We're essentially rediscovering these um, intrinsic connections between a number of these different types of categories of, uh, of variable stars. Uh, what we've been pushing on over the years is pushing down the classification rate. We're now down sort of t at the 15% level over order 20 or 25 classes of variable stars. And as a number of people have mentioned here already, Random Forest is working very well. The other thing we're excited about is kind of working on the taxonomy and being able to do classification on that taxonomy. And so if all I care about is putting something into this category, this category, or this category, then you can often do much better by just saying, I don't know where it is in here, but I'm really confident it's there. And in that sense, we're able to push the gross uh, misclassification rate down to um, order 5%. So this is getting to be pretty good. The thing is, though, we're using this on sort of toy data sets where all the data has already been collected. There's not a lot of pressure in, in getting something right or wrong. And what we want to now learn how to do is take what we've learned in terms of our classification boundaries from one survey. We now want to push that over to a new survey, which is now perhaps just coming online. So one of the important questions that we've been asking is how do we transfer learning from one survey to another? Here you can see in this feature space one and feature space two that um, the classification is uh, very good. In fact, it's essentially perfect for these three different classes. But then when we actually observe the same types of objects with a different survey that has different properties of how you actually obtain the data, you wind up seeing that those exact classification boundaries stop working so well. So we've, we've started using active learning to try to get experts involved in helping us um, basically get good labels for uh, a bunch of these um, different places in this feature space where, as we wind up sort of developing the formalism, if we had those labels, it improves the classifier uh, dramatically. So instead of saying to a bunch of experts, label all of our data so that our classifier gets better um, from survey A to survey B, we can now sort of take a very small subsample. And when you now add sort of only four or 500 more labels, what you wind up seeing is that with each active learning iteration, as we call it, um, you can wind up seeing that the classification um, improves very dramatically. So getting people in, in the real-time loop may be difficult, if not prohibitive, but getting experts involved in helping the machine sort of bootstrap and train um, turns out to be very critical. The other thing is, which I'm sure many of you intuit, is that when you make a classification statement that this is an, uh, you know, of type supernova or this is type RLRE, in the end, what we're really saying is that with some probability, I can tell you that this is what I believe. And so um, it's easy to sort of have a probability vector spit out of a, out of a random forest. 
The question is, um, is that well calibrated? And when I say calibrated, what I mean is, are 20% of the transients you know, classified uh, as a supernova of some type with probability 20%? Um, we really want only 20% of those to be uh, supernova of type that, right? So if I said that it was 100% and only 20% were right, you'd be mad. If I said that um, you know 20% of these things were supernovae and only 10%, you'd also be mad. So you really want to um, now calibrate your probability. So we've been spending a lot of time on, on trying to do that. But the important point is that catalogs of transients and variable stars, and I suspect in other domains, when we get people out of the real-time loop and we now start thinking about resource follow-up, inherently has to become sort of a probabilistic statement, and calibrating those probabilities is absolutely critical. Um, so we have to say goodbye as astronomers to black and white catalogs. Um, and what we've started doing is making um, a, basically a, a catalog of 50,000 um, variable stars with a publicly available data set where you can now sort of browse the taxonomy and um, you can go to the different objects of interest to you. And so you see now we're moving down the classification tree. All this is online at um, bigmac.info. A number of people in the room have been instrumental in doing that. And now you see that every object is basically just the probability of belonging to one of these classes. So here's uh, some light curves. Here's our probability um, vector, essentially the top four. And then we've also added a social component to this. You know, ooh, this is great. Tell your mom. Um, but uh, this data um, and the classification and all the feature vectors are public and available to anyone to, to, to play with. Um, so we're very excited about this. And we think this is sort of the future of what's going to have to happen when people are starting to do science with probabilistic catalogs. And just to finish up, um, you know, there are really sort of two major realms of what you would do with a massive catalog of data that's inherently probabilistic. One is perhaps demographics where you just say, I don't care if I don't get all the objects. I just need that data set to be very high purity. Another possibility, which we've been sort of following through on, is novelty discovery, which is saying, I don't care if I have a lot of contamination in my um, sample that I have to follow up, because finding um, just a few of these objects would be novel enough and interesting enough that I'm willing to tolerate a very low purity just to make sure I get all of those objects of interest. And so to follow through on this, what we did is um, with Adam Miller, another student of mine, and Joey um, and company, um, we started following up on a number of um, highly variable objects. These are changing by sometimes order of magnitude in flux in a catalog that's reasonably bright um, and has been accessible for a number of years, and people have been you know, presumably mining this data for a long time. Um, we were able to find uh, several new instances of um, these rare classes of um, variable stars. And some of them are just hitting you over the head, and you wonder why is it that no one saw this before or noticed this? Well, what's, I think that's sort of captured in this um, nice plot here, which is to plot um, essentially two features. One is the significance of the period. Another is the amplitude, the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of the, of the light curve in, in flux space. And what you wind up seeing is that if you take all the known types of objects and you make different cuts in these feature spaces, you basically only get a few of these things. And underlying this is where all the other data in this um, large catalog wind up living. If I made a cut just to capture of order 75% of the known types of these sources, and these are really the only known versions of these in our entire galaxy, so they are indeed quite rare, you wind up saying that you have to follow up 4,000 of these objects with the spectrum. And that's essentially prohibitively hard. If we now want to capture all of the known objects, we wind up having to observe with large glass, 12,000 of the objects. So what the classifier has allowed us to do is drill down in a multidimensional space, look at just the top essentially 20 objects, get spectra of those, it makes a much more tractable problem for doing discovery. One of these objects uh, was almost as bright as what the human eye could see um, in dark skies today. So I have a little theory that um, you know, perhaps the Babylonians had a god sort of named after this, because it would have been highly variable going away and all that. But this is an incredibly bright object that's been known about um, since early mankind. And it wasn't uh, until this sort of data mining exercise um, and then a little bit of follow-up where we were able to really drill down and, and discover these for what they truly are. So we have a number of um, open questions. I've sort of addressed some of these already. Um, how do we go from one survey to another? How do we really detect outliers in the context of noisy data? Um, how do we imbue sort of physics into our training algorithm? 
And it, what, what I was sort of uh, asking through my questions um, today to some of the other speakers is how do we um, start weighing this classification value with the computational cost? So actually start asking the question, is it even important for me um, or valuable enough for me to compute this uh, feature, um, or is it just not worth it given um, the sort of outcome of what I'm looking for in my classification? Um, so I'll end with that and uh, just basically uh, tell you that um, in astronomy, machine learning uh, is a tool that we've sort of made our own, but I think we're also producing interesting and different types of data sets than the machine learning community um, are used to. And uh, that's been a very, very fruitful collaboration. And I think more importantly, we're using uh, machine learning tools uh, in, in real time, and it's enabling real uh, novel science now. And so this is, for many of us, just sort of the beginning of where things are going. Um, great. So I'll end with that. And uh, I'll note for uh, those that are planning to come tomorrow, I hope all of you are. Uh, food starts at 8 a.m., uh, talks at 9 a.m., and we will have a group picture right before lunch. So wear your best. of a catalog with machine learning behind it and follow-up resources. In a classic astronomy catalog, it's a fairly simple, you're complete down to some magnitude and then there's a smooth roll-off, but this gets much more complicated with you know, what resources were available at the time this was discovered and what the machine thought about it. How do you propose passing that forward into a catalog for doing statistical analyses of a class of objects? It's a good question. It, you're, you're really asking how we can go back out and sort of uh, derive um, science given the uh, known inefficiencies at the time when the statements were made and given the fact that for the best classifiers, they're going to be continually relearning. Um, I haven't given a lot of thought to that. We're certainly not doing that now. So you know, we've got snapshots of code bases as a function of time, and we know what was operating at the time the statements were made. But going back and sort of reproducing that probabilistic statement from that day um, is not something I think the community as a whole has thought about. I mean, with the Google you know, prediction API, you can say, give me version 1.0 or 2.0. Um, at some level, we're able to do that. Um, but uh, you know, going back and now writing a science paper where we say, you know, our classifier said this, but today we'd really say this, and this is better than we said back then. Um, but trust our initial results because that's all we really knew about at the time. Um, that's a, a sort of brave new world, and I, I haven't given a lot of thought to how to how to address that. But it's definitely a, it's going to be a problem when we talk about reproducibility of our results. Implicit in what you're saying is that the hand labeled data is nearly perfect, and that the uh, categorization is the truth. Um, how confident are you in those and why are you so uh, confident? Um, so when we get experts to label data, experts, these were like a bunch of us who were like, what's a variable star? And then we read books on this, and we consulted people, and we showed them light curves, and we actually created a, a Google App Engine web framework to basically um, push the sum total knowledge of everything that's possible, all the papers about that one object, so somebody could actually go in, read papers, make a decision about it. We then voted. Um, those statements over um, order of sort of a dozen experts, and we wound up learning that some people were more expert at predicting known labels because we, we actually cross-validated people, um, and uh, then we could actually basically take aggregate uh, statements from those people. But you're right, in the end, there's also going to be label noise, and there'll be label uncertainty, and there are some classifiers that are sort of capable of dealing with that, where you sort of add weights to different instances. Um, as far as I know, we haven't done that in any of the sort of published frameworks, but we've definitely been talking about how to deal with it. But anyway, we, we wind up essentially, you know, averaging uh, in a complex way over multiple experts who you wind up learning who is more of an expert in a subdomain than other people. And taxonomy? The taxonomy is a really interesting and sort of uh, uh, question, and it's a major bugaboo for us because the taxonomy of variable stars exists 
from basically 100 years ago. And every time you know a new sort of class is found, they're like, oh, what should we stick this into? So there's literally a, a, a major class of variable stars called X-ray, which basically, you know, it just means it has X-ray emission. So at some level, the, the taxonomy really should be some sort of dominant label, and then you really want to have sort of multiple labels, because we also have sort of a cyclic taxonomy where you have some objects which presumably have multiple parents at the top level. It's, it's a terrible admixture of phenomenology and theory. So we look at something, and I see it going up and down like this, I don't know intrinsically that it's pulsational. That's the origin of why that's changing. It could be that another star is moving in front of it. So um, we, have a, we have this classification scheme, which is a really sort of Frankenstein hybrid of the two. Ideally, what you'd like to do is sort of have a purely phenomenological scheme and a purely sort of physical scheme and see how they map or how they break down. But at some level, one of the possibilities is exploring the creation of that taxonomy, uh, you know, purely from just looking at distances in an unsupervised way. Good. That looks like Josh and all of us.